Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Shalom. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I would just like to make an announcement, if I may, that there is a videotape outside on sale at 25 rand, the birth and death of Christianity featuring our guest speaker, Dr. Tariq, or Dr. Khalid, as is also called, Al-Mansur. We also have Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ, as a free handout. If you didn't get your copy yet, please make sure you get one while stocks last. The translation of the glorious Qur'an by Allah Yusuf Ali. The translation is on sale at the unbelievable price of five rands per copy. Buy one for yourself, buy one for your neighbor, and buy one for a friend, and then for as many marriages as you know are coming off. We also have refreshments and I was told the refreshments are available in the southern corner of the building. Your guess is as good as mine. I'm not going to point in any direction. The Habibia Bookshop has got a vast selection of very interesting, informative, well-presented books on sale. Do avail yourselves of that opportunity. Also, there have been lectures at the University of Cape Town on Monday at lunchtime by our guest speaker, Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur. There was a lecture on Monday evening in the Seapoint Civic Center, Islam and other religions. In the Athlone Civic Center last night, we had the Gulf Crisis, you know what the topic is for tonight. Islam, Christianity, or communism, which one holds the solution to the problems of South Africa? Tomorrow evening in Westridge Civic Center, Dr. Khalid will again be on duty and he will address the topic, Africa, the sleeping giant. I thank you for your patience and we are glad you could come. We are just sorry you didn't bring one or two more of your friends with. We have reached that point now where I declare this gathering officially open. And before we do anything further, I'm now going to call on our brother Rashid Brown to do the rendering of the translation of uh, the rendering of the recital of the Quran that he has prepared for us tonight. Shukran. Auz billahi min ash-shaytan Don't. 
بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم كلا إن الإنسان بيطغى أن رآه استغنى إن إلى ربك رجعا أرأيت الذي ينهى عبدا إذا صلى أرأيت إن كان على الهدى أو أمر بالتقوى أرأيت إن كذب وتولى ألم يعلم بأن الله يرى ودق الله العظيم ما شاء الله Sadaq Allahu Mawlana Al-Azim I think it is fitting for me to give you another name this evening Mr. Rashid Brown I think we can dub you as Sawtil Jannah the voice from heaven Shukran Jazeelan and may I say in public that I'm sure you carry the blessings of all the people here tonight we will wish you well over the forthcoming examinations and the future life inshallah Ladies and gentlemen, one morning after a lecture of this kind, I was phoned at, at work by a brother or a person who had come up in the audience from the audience to put questions. And he said, I looked for you. I wanted to ask you a question. I wanted to speak to you. And I phoned Rosmeet Supermarket because I thought you were the boss of Rosmeet. I said, I've got news for you. I also thought so. To put the record straight, I'd just like to say the people on the platform at the moment, on my far right is the boss of Rosmeet, Mr. Salih Muhammad. Right next to him, perhaps Salih needs a little bit more introduction than this man. We all know him, Ahmad Dirat, the acclaimed internationally scholar of Islam. And he is so well known that I don't think it is fitting for me to give any further introductions for him. On my left, we have our guest speaker for the evening, Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur. But to start the evening, I have great pleasure in calling upon Brother Ahmad Didat from Durban to give us an introduction for the proceedings this evening. Brother Ahmad Didat. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الإسلام ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة ومما رزقناهم ينفقون صدق الله صدق الله مرا نزيل مستر تشيرمان مدي أبرزن برزن I have been asked again and again during the course of Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur's lecture tour, how did I come to meet the man? This jewel, how did I happen to capture it? And I find the answer in the Holy Quran, Allah has set a law. The law is 
Everyone has a goal, a destination, a manzil maqsood towards which is being driven. Everyone. Whether you like it or you not, everybody is going to some destination. And the thing we are asked to do is, first study for khairat, so compete with one another in good works, and Allah will bring you all together, wheresoever ye may be. This is His law. One Friday morning, about two months ago, an advocate, A.B. Muhammad by name, in Durban, he brings Dr. Khalid to my office. First time in my life I see the doctor. He introduces me by name. He didn't register very well. I shook hands. A man from the Middle East, or a man from America, I shook hands and he sat down at the back of my office. And the other gentleman tells me that he had heard about a lecture that our brother had given in Johannesburg on the rise and demise of Christianity. The chairman spoke to you about the tape. It's available in the file. The rise and demise of Christianity. And that title tickles me because this is my field. Though I have not handled a subject like that, but I said, the rise and demise, I want to know. I want to rob the man of his knowledge. So the other brother suggests, he said, look, why don't you organize a lecture for him? I said, I'm ready. It's a Friday morning, 10 o'clock, and in two hours time we'll be going to the masjid for Yawm al Juma. And I'm told that 4 o'clock he's got to leave for the airport. Can you imagine? what he's being asked. Arrange the lecture, but there's hardly any time. I said, right, you must rob the man. And Islam allows you that, robbing people of the knowledge. So I said, right, two o'clock. The doctor was ever ready. This is it. You must be prepared to share your talents. And in the ayah I read to you, from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter 2, the last phrase, وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِكُونَ And who spend out of what we have provided for them. Anything, everything Allah has given you, we have to use each and every one of these gifts of Allah, talents. Whether it be wealth, whether it be health, whether it be whatever talent, art, whatever you have got, strength. Every aspect of your being, we have to use for ourselves in moderation and to share with others. And the brother was ever ready. Same thing, our Qari this evening. Same lifestyle. At a minute's notice, he said, look, I want you to write. He's prepared to share his talents. Same thing to our chairman. There is something common, as you see, that in sharing, Allah gives you more. And this is how I discovered Dr. Khalid al-Mansur. And inshallah, the chairman will introduce him properly to you. And we'll listen. we are all looking forward to listening to him. Wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you, Brother Ahmed. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment has finally arrived. I would just like to give the format of this evening. I will call upon our guest speaker to deliver his talk. And when he has completed, I will lay the floor open for questions. People will be requested to come to the microphone placed in the front of the platform here for that specific purpose to come and put their questions. Dr. Khalid has got a peculiar nature. He's bubbling over with information and with knowledge. If one person comes to the microphone and puts a question, he's quite able and he will be quite willing to give another lecture in reply. To prevent that, we would like people to be at least two or three people at a time at the microphone so that they can give you a short and pithy answer and to try and answer as many questions pertaining to his topic tonight as possible. Now, I only met Dr. Khalid, for which I was very privileged, on Monday evening for the first time. I've heard him from the stage. And I've sat with him after the evening's deliberations at the home of Salih Muhammad and I learned
to know more about the man. Dr. Khalid probably has a string of recognition titles behind his name. He comes from California. He's not afraid to tell you, in case you can't see from there, that he's black. He is a businessman, he is a banker, and he is a trained lawyer. But I think, if we think in terms of titles, the one that he perhaps likes to claim to be the most melodious for him is that he is simply a Muslim activist. And whatever knowledge and experiences he has picked up over the years, he wants to share that with as many people as possible. And that, I think, is exactly why we have him here this evening. So I will now call upon Dr. Khalid to address the subject Islam, Christianity, or Communism, which one holds the solutions for the problems of South Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I hand you now to Dr. Khalid Al-Mansur. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Brothers and sisters and ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests at the speaker's table, it would be very difficult for me to convey to you how happy and proud I am to be here with you this evening. There are a number of reasons why I'm so happy to be with you, among which are, it was not long ago, approximately 300 years ago, from that date into the millions of years, our ancestors walked together on this great continent. And to be back among you, my people, is a joy and a delight. I cannot tell you how many African Americans have died with the hope that one day we would all be reunited. So therefore, you will not be surprised to learn that I have brought guests with me, guests who have been patiently waiting for 300 years to be able to greet you, men of the likes of Sing Q, W.E.B. Dubois, the famous Marcus Garvey, and his mentor, Musa Muhammad Ali. I also bring you greetings from those who have paid great price, like Reverend Martin Luther King and Malcolm X, who would like you to know that we are one family. We are part and will always be inseparable as one people on a great and mighty continent of Africa, a continent that is so expansive, difficult to conceptualize. When you take India and put it next to China and then put it those two next to Western Europe and then put all three next to the United States and then put them all together, they fit inside of this great continent of Africa. A massive conglomeration of land, embracing various climates and people and attitudes and outlooks. A land, according to the anthropologists and the archaeologists, that was selected to house the first humans on Earth. We have skeletons that demonstrate the age of a young 12-year-old boy in the land of Kenya, and his age, according to the potassium test, 
administered by the scientists, one million six hundred thousand years ago, that young man, twelve years old, walked in the land of Kenya. Looking closer to home, we have learned that in the country of Zaire, they found artifacts made by man. And these artifacts have also been dated. And the dates enable us with certainty to establish that two million years ago, just north of here, Zaire, African people walked on this continent. But ladies and gentlemen, though two million is a long time, I have saved some of the most exciting news to last. In this very country, in the Transvaal, they have discovered artifacts made by man, and they have been dated, and the date has been established as three million years ago. Humans were carving stone in order to survive. So you can appreciate my joy of just being in a massive continent that Allah has seen fit to bless with human life and animal life and plant life and seeds and rivers and mountains and lakes, a great continent, but perhaps greater than the physical surroundings is the proof by the linguists, the archaeologists, the anthropologists, my brothers and my sisters, proof that we were there from the beginning. From the beginning, we were part and parcel of the creation. I want to tell you about some of the things that Africa has done, but that may take me a little away from my topic. Suffice it to say that when the African on the West Coast the Mandingo tribes, who were Muslims, sailed to Mexico and carved into the mountains, and it remains there tonight, Allah Akbar, Columbus had not yet been born. Suffice it to say, when the Vramba tribe and the Karinga tribe in what is today Zimbabwe during the great Zimbabwe ruined construction were beginning to design massive monuments. It has now been established beyond any doubt that the Karanga people and the Vramba people were Muslims. Muslims. You, of course, know what we did in Egypt when we astounded the world with a architectural design called a pyramid. And just so that no one could ever forget, they carved at the top of the pyramid a brother who looked just like me. Just so there would be no doubt that we were involved in every dimension of life, creating and contributing from the beginning. It would be very easy for me to give a lecture on the sleeping giant, but that's tomorrow night. Tonight, the topic is much more difficult, much more complicated, much more delicate. It is a topic that relates to the future of this very country. It relates to the future 
of you and your children and your grandchildren. It relates to the future of every group comprising the Union of South Africa. White, Asian, colored, black, one nation, the topic tonight that I have accepted to address is looking at this country and looking at the future. Can this country really make it? Can this country really make it? And if so, what contribution can come from the Christian, the Muslim, and or the communist? Now that could take at least a month to talk about, to go over each potential contributory to try to assess the probability of a contribution. And obviously there are many groups and institutions that we haven't included in the matrix. We just selected three. There could have been 20 or 25. And I'm sure some of you will say, why didn't you include the ANC or PAC? Why didn't you include ICASA? We have selected three for tonight, but I may well return to select three more for another night. For we are desperate to know, for your peace of mind, is there a viable future? Are we wasting time, or is there something to look forward to that is practical and realistic? That's what we want to know. And for that, empty phrases and speeches will not suffice. To determine whether or not we have a future, I cannot just give you some rhetoric and tell you everything is bound to be all right. If you have faith, that will not do. We must think together. We must employ logic and reason. And it is your logic and reason that I'm asking you to invest in me. I need your prayer. I need your attention. I need your reflection. I need your meditation. Because I firmly believe that Allah will provide through memory and recall if you become a part of the collector's unconsciousness, we will have reliable empirical data from which to assess each of the three groups, the Christians, the Muslims, and the communists. I must tell you at the onstart that in approaching this topic, I have no intention of trying to flatter the Muslim or to bash the Christian or to scold the communist. I am not a politician. I want to call it like it is. If the Muslims have shortcomings, I want to describe those shortcomings, you would expect nothing less from me. If the Christians have shortcomings, I want to describe those shortcomings. The same holds true for the communists. The purpose is not to criticize. The purpose is to evaluate what we can expect from these three groups. And therefore, I want you to know that I will begin with a brief outline of the problem. Of course, you realize like I do, one could discuss and describe and quantify the problems of South Africa for the next three months nonstop. 
You have heard the problem so many times. I did not travel thousands of miles from America with Brother W.B. Du Bois and Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X just to repeat something you already know. I am describing briefly the problem only to form a context. And then I want to move quickly to solution. I have six brief categories of problems. And then six categories of solutions, because that will give us hope or it will make us despondent. And I am going to tell it just like it is. If I don't believe there's any hope, I will tell you. For logical reasons, I think you are wasting time. There is no hope. Let me go find some other place for you to live. I will not abandon you, and I will not leave you. Neither will I deceive you. I want to talk about solutions. Then I want to ask the Christians, the Muslims, and the communists, here are practical solutions. Here is a condensed master plan. No speeches. What are you going to do to implement the master plan? So when we leave here this evening, we leave with the feeling of knowing what we actually need to move ahead in this country throughout the 20th and on to the 21st century. That is why I am here. What problems then are we going to try to solve? We have arbitrarily selected six categories. It may well be that history will record the most important problem is spiritual in nature. For the masses of people in South Africa, if there is not a spiritual revival, we have no future. We have no future. We need an internal revival to restore the spirit of the people. All the government legislation in the world, all the government reforms in the world, all the money in the world cannot restore what has been taken from the people and left them as residual crippled. Having little confidence in themselves, having little motivation, plagued with alcoholism, plagued with indifference, passivity, lacking in energy and direction, unless we can rebuild the spirit of this great nation, we have no future. There will surely be a bloodbath as the East follows the West. It is the people who must believe in their future. And my people in this country, numbering some 30 million, have been robbed of a balanced equilibrium within their personality, and it must be restored. That is the spiritual problem we must face. Educationally, we need a mass education program. From the cradle to the grave, education and knowledge must be the key to the morning and the gate to the evening. We must love and crave knowledge in order for this country to be able to establish an infrastructure to support social and economic development. We must have a revision in the curriculum so we know what courses to study. 
Many students are at the university pursuing courses that have no relevance to the 21st century. When they graduate, they will be looking and searching for employment. Many will be frustrated and they will feel deceived because there will be few jobs in the areas they have majored. We have to know what to study to be prepared for the 21st century. Just being in college or in high school is not enough. We have to know where our course of study fits in to the picture of survival and prosperity. We cannot spend three and five times more on white education than we do on black education. Cannot continue if you expect to develop an educational structure that's functional and reliable. There's some four million black youth scattered around this country who dropped out of school in the 70s and who are now virtually functionally illiterate. Where will they work? Will you now tell them to go back to school after they have reached the age of 28 and 29 and 30, when they have been told that they had paid their dues and they had made their contribution to freedom? Are you now, in 1990, telling them you made a mistake? To be free is to have an education. How will you instill the motivation? You can build all the schools you want, but without motivation, we are not prepared to bring prosperity to this country. Motivation means something that you crave, not television programs and not magazines, and not dances, knowledge, craving it, craving it. I want knowledge from the senior citizen to the young child. We have to have an environment where knowledge is the object of our pursuit. That does not exist today among the vast majority of this great country. The family must be restored. The family has been destroyed. The lack of respect for women has become atrocious. Abuse of children, alcoholism, tribalism, these ills must be corrected if we are seriously going to ask the three categories of institutions to contribute to the prosperity in the 20th and 21st century of South Africa. Economically, my friends, the problem is best described with a few statistics. When white people arrived in South Africa, the Africans had all the land and the white people had all the Bible. Today, the Africans have the Bible. 87% of every inch of land in this country is owned by whites. 95% of all the assets in this country is owned by whites. For the farmers, 50,000 white farmers receive from the government subsidies 12 times greater than 14 million black farmers in this country tonight. We need not discuss these shanties that I see all over the place. For District 6, perhaps I should not mention that. Perhaps that will bring back bad memories. But that's a part of an economic structure that cannot endure in its present form. Finally, politically, there must be a sharing of power. Not one black in this country, although they represent some 80% of the country, can vote. Now, that is 
our matrix of problems. The solution take very little time to describe, but they form the master plan. Educationally, we know what we have to do. Mass education, signs on the businesses, on the telephone poles, all through the homeland. Education, education, education. We have to have it or we have no future. Spiritually, we have to restore the respect for the people for themselves and their community. That also can be done, but it cannot be done if the people do not know their history. They have been taught that they have never done anything in this world, that people of African descent are inferior. They have been taught that Africans will never be able to do anything, that they must always look to white people. They have been taught that God is white, Jesus is white, Mary is white, Moses is white, and everyone in the Bible is white. And this has been beaten into them year after year after year. It has robbed them of their sense of balance. We must not lie. We must not distort. But we must tell the truth. We must tell our brothers in Africa the kind of civilization they had in this country before the Dutch came in 1652. We know about that because of the writings of Mr. Jean Van Veitch. We know. We know from the diaries of shipwrecked seamen right off the Cape and Natal, the Chief Nisi boat. The men stayed in the interior for about six years, and they described the life of the African people. The people in Africa need to know that because it will restore in them a sense of future. The African people, according to the sailors, were not shiftless, were not lazy, were not alcoholic. Before the Dutch came, we need to go back and teach about the blast furnace. It's only a thousand miles in the interior that the Soho tribe used to make copper. And they made a blast furnace over 2,000 years ago. Over 2,000 years ago. A blast furnace, and the temperature was raised to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. That is what the sea sailors said. They described it. They talked about the knives and the spears that the African people made. Subsequently, they were taught they'd done nothing. We need to go back to Egypt and go back to Zimbabwe and go back to the Mandingo and go all the way to Mexico and see the Aztecs to get the real history of our people so that we rebuild, rebuild the personality of all the people in this country. And while we're rebuilding the masses of blacks, we need to rebuild the colors and the Asians. Because the colors came here historically from great nations. And those nations are today rising. Indonesia, in Malaysia, we need to know more about our roots. You think it's not necessary? Why is the clerk in Holland? The clerk is in Holland telling everyone, I'm of Dutch descent. Look at me, my friends. We are all related. If he can go to Holland to reclaim his blood, it is time for us to be reunited with Sri Lanka and Indonesia in Malaysia because that blood is in us. And we, I'm sure, are proud of that. Ladies and gentlemen, economically we know what we have to do. We need manufacturing. We need self-sufficiency in agriculture. You cannot make it if you don't feed yourself. We need vocational training so that we have an educated labor force to be able to move into the 21st century. 
We need to reform the structure and we need to get rid of the view that we don't have any ability. We need some businessmen. We need to expand that business fear, like the Japanese, so that people begin to recognize and realize that we are not beggars. We must get rid, once and for all, of the mentality that we are beggars. Either begging the World Bank, or begging the International Monetary Fund, or begging the Arabs in the Middle East, or begging the United States, or begging Europe. We cannot sustain our pride if we have been reduced to beggars. It is now time for us to rise up and take our place among the economic giants of the world. It can be done. And that's what we're going to ask the Christians and the Muslims and the communists. What is your program? We want two million jobs in the next 18 months. We want each of these groups to tell us what they're going to do. According to the World Bank, three million jobs a year must be open in this country just to keep abreast of the population development. Three million jobs. Now that's what we want to know. No political speech. If you listen to the politicians, they will tell you, well, we're going to integrate the processes that balance inflation underneath supply and demand over elasticity so that we may have hope. It's nonsense. Nonsense. All we want to know from all the politicians, stop the nonsense. How are you going to open up two million jobs in the next 18 months. Give us the specifics. We may not be intelligent enough to lead the country, but we are tell intelligent enough to ask where we are being led. Specific. If you let these politicians stay up in the clouds with a lot of fancy rhetoric, it'll end in a bloodbath. Get down to the nitty gritty. Two million jobs. Self-sufficiency in agriculture. How are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? What can we expect in the next five years? A detailed plan, and we want to keep you to the plan. Mass education. Using entertainers to proclaim the message in every mosque, in every church. Education. These are practical solutions to practical problems. Now we want to find out the key question. Christians, Muslims, communists, what can we expect?